Greetings for just a moment. Um, we're going to have a, a prayer of blessing for our food and for this um, wonderful occasion in just a moment. My name is uh, Leonard Allen. I serve as the Dean of the College of Bible and Ministry here at Lipscomb. And um, our prayer is going to be led here in a moment by Dr. Stephen Bonner, who serves as the uh, Chair of Undergraduate um, Bible here at Lipscomb and is doing a great work in both recruiting students and helping to guide them toward um, the ministry um, as, as they are trained with us. So uh, Steve Bonner will come and lead us in prayer and then I'll have another word to say. Good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to see all of you gathered around the table sharing in meal. Will you pray with me? Holy Father, we thank you for this moment, the beauty of this day, the fellowship that we're sharing in, and the food that is before us. We are indeed grateful. We're grateful to share in this time, this great celebration that we all are here for this week, the opportunities we have, Father, to give you all honor and glory. As we partake of this food, we're mindful of those who have prepared it, and we give great thanks. For those who will be speaking today, for the installation of Dr. McQueen tomorrow, for the opportunities we have as a community here at Lipscomb and abroad to celebrate the great work you do and you partner with us, Father, in your work in the kingdom, we are indeed a grateful people. So we give thanks. We give you honor and all glory. And in this prayer, we ask, amen. Continue eating. Um as if you might need my encouragement to do that. <laughs> I just want to say a, a quick uh, word of update about uh, our work in the College of Bible and Ministry. Um, <clears throat> one, one announcement that some of you may have heard in the last few months, but if, in case you haven't, I wanted to make sure you do. Um, the College of Bible received uh, last fall a $1.1 million grant from a private foundation in Minnesota. And this grant is focused toward a, an accelerated pastoral leadership training program. Um, that means to say a young person, and they want to focus on young people here, people who are ready to come to college, um, a young person can receive both a master's degree, I mean, a, a bachelor's degree in ministry and a master's degree, a 48-hour master's degree in pastoral leadership in five years, with that graduate work overlapping the final year of their undergraduate degree. And we have um, in the funding um, a new recruiter we have uh, acquired to help build this program. We have an aggressive um, number of, uh, of a goal for our first cohort. And we're excited. And this is an indication uh, of our ongoing commitment to serve churches. Uh, our interest and the interest of this foundation kind of merged because they, like us, believe that we need to have more leaders, more ministers to serve churches. That number has been steadily declining for a long time now. And this is an attempt by our college to uh, reverse that and to renew that. Just wanted you to know that commitment to churches is at the heart of our ministry training goal at Lipscomb. And it's an honor and a pleasure most days uh, for, me to, <laughs> for me to serve uh, as the dean and to help lead this uh, grand kingdom venture. I'm going to call up now um, Scott Sager, who serves as a professor of Bible, but also as a vice president for church services at Lipscomb, and he's going to introduce our speaker of the hour. Thanks, Leonard. Thanks, Leonard. Um, it's my privilege to introduce to you all Mark Lanier, who is here with his wife, Becky. 
We're excited that Mark is an alum of Lipscomb University. We're excited that Mark is part of the Board of Trustees here at Lipscomb University. And we're excited that he's here today to talk about his fourth book. His first book was called Psalms for Today, and it won awards. And then he followed that up with Torah for Today. And then he began to take a look at some of the great apologists apologetic issues of our day. He wrote a book called Christianity on Trial, and he's followed that up with the book that's before you as a free gift, I might add, from Mark and Becky today, Atheism on Trial. If you look at the screen, I have a few pictures uh, that I can show you of Mark, but I can't tell if they just changed. Did they? Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> Mark was born in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, he and Becky have been friends since middle school or high school. Uh, he came to Lipscomb and studied biblical languages, focusing upon Hebrew and Greek, and then he went to Texas Tech for law school. Uh, Becky went to Pepperdine University to get a law degree, and they actually worked together. It didn't click. Uh, oh, okay, I can see them now. Yeah. Uh, they actually worked together uh, before uh, they were married. Uh, Mark and Becky have five children. They have eight grandchildren and another on the way. Mark is recognized regularly as one of the leading legal minds in the country. He has won cases on metal on metal hips, talcum powder, opioids, asbestos, big pharma. But what you all need to know is that that passion has allowed him to focus upon his real calling, which is biblical studies. What you're looking at here is the Lanier Theological Library in Houston. It's 16,000 square feet and expanding right now. It holds over 10,000 volumes of work. If you ever get to go and you get to visit inside, you'll see collections, you'll see Qumran jars, you'll see Dead Sea Scroll fag fragments, pottery and mosaic, and my favorite part is the first edition of every C.S. Lewis book uh, ever in print. Uh, the library is open to the public. It is used regularly. The librarian, David Capes, is with us today and will be leading our closing prayer. Across from the library, you'll find this replica of a Byzantine chapel, and they host lectures inside uh, where famous scholars like N.T. Wright, Alistair McGrath, Peter Lloyd, and many others come and speak. And Becky hosts lectures there in Spanish as well. But what I want you to know about Mark and Becky and why we love them so much and appreciate them is their hospitality. Uh, you might remember that when Hurricane Harvey hit Houston, uh, we were able to take a group of 32 students to Houston to help with the relief. And when Mark and Becky found out about it, they insisted that they host all 32 of us at their home. And so this is a picture of Becky, who I told you was a great hostess, uh, welcoming 18 of our students to live with them for four days inside of their house. And while we were there, we worked very hard all day. But thanks to Mark and Becky, we also played very well every evening. Mark and Becky have a train that goes around their property and Mark welcomed us from our hard day's work, took us on a tour of the grounds and we actually got to feed lemurs uh, on his property as well. That night, Mark gave us a VIP tour of the library and really challenged students to think about biblical studies and the important role that it plays in the life of every student who comes to Lipscomb. Becky was our hostess throughout. She threw parties for us every evening. She actually uh, had a movie night and a pool party uh, one evening as well. But the highlight for so many of us was Sunday morning when we gathered in the chapel and Mark walked us through looking at the ceiling of the chapel, the entire biblical story painted on the ceiling. And when we came to the part about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, uh, we stopped in the chapel, we broke bread together, we celebrated communion, and uh, that's a memory that I will never forget. Uh, we close by thanking Mark for being one of our alums and for hosting us, and I just want Mark and Becky to know how grateful we are that they have come to be a part of this inauguration ceremony and festivities. And Mark, we're excited about your book. Uh, you should notice that on your table, there are some note cards in the center. 
Uh, Mark is an attorney, and he's not afraid of any question you might send his way. And so what we've asked is so for Mark to take the next 30 minutes to present his case, and then we'll take 30 minutes for him to field questions from you. So if you have something, write it down, and I'll gather those cards in about 30 minutes, and then we'll pepper Mark with questions for our final 30 minutes of our time together. Please join me in welcoming Mark Lanier. Thank you, Scott. You're very kind. Uh, Dr. McQueen, congratulations. I am so excited as an alum that you are going to be leading this august institution. And it is a thrill to get to play any part of your inauguration and to get to be here to speak to you all today. Uh, I, those of you I don't know, my name is Mark Lanier. I practice law for a living, but my passion is my faith. Now, I had prepared a PowerPoint. And if you are able to see the screen. Is my PowerPoint up? If you are able to see the screen, I can put slides up. I can tell you about this book, Atheism on Trial. I can tell you about the preceding volume, Christianity on Trial. I can tell you it's a trilogy from IVP. And the third volume, I've sent in the, the initial manuscript. And so it's getting peer reviewed and it will come out probably about this time next year. And it's something else on top trial. I'm not sure exactly how we'll title it. <laughs> Um, no, technically, it's going to be world religions on trial, and, uh, it, and I'm excited about that, that manuscript and hope to have a chance to talk to you about it. I thought the most effective way I might be able to make my case to you today is just to introduce my book to you. So I'm glad that you've all got a copy uh, of the books in, in, in front of you, and thank you, Scott, for doing all of the hard work to get those here in time. It's greatly appreciated, but this is my chance for you to shake hands with the book, take the book with you, uh, have a good time with it, and hopefully uh, you'll get to know it a little bit. Now, here's the situation that I've got. Most of you are people. Look, I'm a lawyer. I live in a world of sharks. Most of you are people. And people are hardwired for truth. It's something we all gravitate towards. And when we find truth, we grab a hold of it. We, we want authenticity. Nobody likes the fake. Nobody intentionally wants to live or life based on a, a lie. I'm not saying there aren't some people who have some aberrant personality that, that lives in deception, but we call them deviants for a reason. They deviate from what normal human wiring of the brain is. And because we're hardwired for truth, it's an interesting way that God has made the world. God has made this world in a way that reflects his character. If you look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, Paul says that, that God has built into creation invisible characteristics and, and traits of himself. And so you can look just in nature itself and find truth. And some people have, and they've glommed onto that truth and thought as a result, anything outside of what they've grabbed hold of, anything outside of nature must be false. That's another human tendency. We tend to think things are in dichotomies, one or the other. We never think of two things being true at the same time, so readily at least. And so you've got a world of people who have found truth in nature. And as a result, they don't think that super nature, the supernatural, is an element or an arena of truth. And that's their own shortcoming. So what I have tried to do in this book is to take atheism and put it on trial. Not from the perspective of, okay, I'm a Christian, I believe in the Bible, and so here is what the Bible says about atheism, it must be wrong. 
Well, that's nothing but circular reasoning. I've instead tried to approach it as a lawyer would in a courtroom. I make a living out of trying to prove things. American courts are based on truth. Oh, it doesn't always get it right. We have appellate courts. Oh, sometimes it's David versus Goliath and it seems like an unfair fight. But the bottom line is American courts, more than any other institution in the history of humanity, are the best at determining what truth is on certain kinds of issues. So we have no trouble using a court to decide whether or not someone's life is forfeit because they committed a crime so heinous they don't deserve to live. We trust that the courts get that right. We trust that the courts get it right enough to determine which child goes to live with which parents in those tragic cases of divorce. We trust that a court is good enough at getting to the truth that if Billy Bob runs a red light and hits Susie Q, then a jury's going to be able to assess who's telling the truth and who ran the red light. American courts are the pinnacle of this, but it's not done by rolling the dice. It's not done by paying the jurors under the table. It's not done by paying the judge under the table. It's done through an elaborate system that requires proof. And so within the framework of that, the key to anything is, well, let me back it up. You've got to have an impartial jury. Things go awry if a jury is partial. So I urge people, I urge believers and I urge unbelievers. And I urge people who are kind of half and half. I urge them, set aside your preconceptions as you read my book. I don't want you to be a, I believe in God, so I'm going to read this just to prove how right I am. I don't want you to be a, I don't believe in God, so I'm going to read this just to show how bogus Lanier is. I want you to try and say, I'm going to read this with an open mind, as open as I can have, and see if it makes a case. Because I believe that it does. So let me just briefly, and I'll do this very briefly, respond to this question, can you prove God exists? And a lot of people will say, well, no, of course you can't. That's why you have faith. I don't, I don't answer it that way. Uh, I, I certainly have faith, and I, and I certainly recognize that faith has a responsibility here and a role here, but I do believe there's compelling proof of the existence of God. So compelling that I really wouldn't have trouble taking it into a courtroom and trying the case, and I think I'd win more times than I would lose as long as I had an impartial jury. And, and so what I'll do for you is three things real quick. I want to talk to you about what it means to prove something. I want to talk to you about the two main options you've got on this issue. And then the third thing is I'll talk to you a little bit about what the evidence is. And I brought this up here, not because I'm going to eat it in front of you, but this is my demonstrative in a minute. But it's about to fall, it's a, it's about to fall on my suit. And that's not the demonstrative I was looking for. <laughs> Let's start with proof. See, this is, this is the catch problem that most people have. Our son took two of his degrees in Oxford University, and, and I had many times to talk to his friends, and, and he took his master's and his DPhil there, and it was in philosophy and logic. And so his friends were smarter than a tree full of owls. Um, I mean, they couldn't get into Lipscomb probably, but they were, <laughs> they, they, they could get to Oxford. And, um, and it was so interesting to talk to them because the idea of proof is something that they'd never thought through outside of their own academic arena. So for example, 
If you're in the area of mathematics, there are ways to prove mathematical theorems. You can form a hypothesis and you can walk through and you can get to ultimate proof of mathematics. Not just mathematics, but if you want to know if you got disease, you get 99% reliability with certain COVID tests. You can also uh, take a measuring cup and tell you how much flour you've got that you're about to dump into that uh, banana nut bread you're going to make. I mean, you just take a measuring cup. You say, well, that looks like about a cup of flour. You want to know? Take a one cup measure, dump the flour in there, and you'll know that's a cup. You can use a thermometer to tell you what the temperature is. By the way, it was cold this morning. You can use a thermometer and it'll tell you what temperature is. All of these different devices will tell you different things that they prove. Does that make sense? Okay, but now look at the problem. Can I take a thermometer and use it to prove that I love my wife. Thermometer is not going to help me prove that I love my wife. I, I do. I, I adore Becky. And I love her. I think sometimes those are two different things. There are times where she loves me but probably doesn't adore me. But, you know, she, she, we, we have a love for each other. So I tried a case. It was uh, the widow Ernst versus Merck Pharmaceuticals concerned a drug called Vioxx. Vioxx was a pain-relieving drug. It would help you with your arthritic pain. The problem is it caused a heart attack in the process, but just uh, not to everyone, just six times more people than those who took other drugs that were just as effective at alleviating the pain. And the company hid that truth from the FDA and the public. So I took the case to trial. I represented the widow Ernst. Her husband, Bob Ernst, died. He'd been taking Vioxx for hand pain. This is not some fellow who was one pork chop away from a heart attack. He was a, a, a runner, a, a biker, a racer in great shape, and he ate fish that wasn't fried. Healthy fella. Now, one of the things I had to prove to win that case was not simply that the drug caused his heart attack. I represented his widow. He's gone. He's not going to get a dime of money out of this case. For his widow to win, I had to prove that she loved him and he loved her. And the court requires me to prove it. And the jury requires me to prove it. Well, how do you prove that? You going to do that with a thermometer? Are you going to do that with some measuring cups? No, that's not the way you prove it. The court instructs on proof on such issues. Issues like that are proven by the greater weight of credible evidence. You establish how credible is the evidence. And you put the evidence for on one side and against on the other. And then you see which has the greater weight, which is more likely than not. Now that's in a civil case. In a criminal case, you've got to, got to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. But those are requirements of proof in a courtroom. And we will make policy statements on that. We uncovered that Johnson & Johnson talc-based baby powder had asbestos in it. Asbestos causes mesothelioma cancers, it causes lung cancer, and it causes ovarian cancer. And it'll wait typically 40 years before the cancer sets in. So on behalf of 22 women, I took them to trial in St. Louis, Missouri a couple of years ago. The jury awarded a huge verdict, big enough that Johnson & Johnson quit selling that baby powder in the United States and Canada. They pulled it from the shelves. They will no longer sell baby powder that's based on talc powder. Now it's cornstarch. But in the process of doing that, something that caused cataclysmic changes to that company, I had to prove it 
by the greater weight of credible evidence. And that case was upheld all the way through the United States Supreme Court. Because that is the truth. The baby powder based on talc had asbestos in it and nobody knew about it and mothers were sucking that stuff in every time they buy, diapered their babies. And so were the babies. Proof is the greater weight of credible evidence. And if we understand that that's the way you prove things that aren't mathematics, that's the way you prove things, and you can use a litmus strip to tell if something's a base or an acid in chemistry. You can use different tools for different things. But if you want to try and prove or disprove the existence of God, you can't do that with mathematical formula. You can't do that with a thermometer. You've got to do that by assessing the evidence for and against. Put it in the scales. Look at the credibility. Judge the credibility. And see what the greater weight of credible evidence is. That's proof. Now, ultimately, you're going to have two options that I look at in this book. You say, well, aren't there some other options? Where's the Zen Buddhist option? Okay, that's coming up in the next book. More stuff on trial. But in this book, I weigh two real options. Look, here they are. Competing views of reality. One of these is real. Either there's no God or there's a God. Doesn't get any more black and white than that. No more stark than that. There's either no God or there's a God. Now, each of those explanations for the world are going to have certain implications. Certain things are necessarily true under either of those views of reality. If there's no God, then you and I, my friends, are just sacks of chemicals. That's all we are. You're a bunch of water, which means you're a bunch of hydrogen, bunch of oxygen. You got some carbon. I think you got some phosphorus in there. You're just, and you're held together by this skin. You're a sack of chemicals. That's, that, that, I, I hate to pop your bubble. If you were thinking you were something special, you're a sack of chemicals. Let me tell you something else. Some of your chemicals are interacting with each other. Your brain synapses are chemical interactions. Okay, well, that's great. I can take certain chemicals and interact them and make some chunk of junk like this. But it's, and don't get me wrong, tasty, sure. But still, this is just a bunch of chemicals. That's all it is. That's all that is. Now, some of these chemicals in your brain interact and in your body interact. Okay, that's fine. And some of our interactions, we have electrical interactions too. You know, you do something here and the nerves have electrical currents that'll go up to your brain and tell you you just poked yourself on the hand. And I guess we want to say that our interactions, these chemical and electrical interactions make us different than other animals. I'm not sure where we get that arrogance from if there is no God. But this is all you are. Our sack may be different than other sacks of chemicals. By the way, if there's no God, who draws the line at a sack of chemicals being okay to be different or not okay to be different? We say, well, you know, some human beings are worth more than an ape. So we can use an ape for a medical experiment to help the human beings that are worth more. But let's take human beings out of it and let's say sack of chemicals. We can say some sacks of chemicals 
aren't worth as much as other sacks of chemicals. So we can do some medical experiments on some sacks of chemicals to help the other sacks of chemicals have better chemical interactions. Well, that was Mengele's basis for all of the experimentation he did on Jews, on homosexuals, and on those with mental disabilities. This is their sacks of chemicals. We need to experiment on those sacks of chemicals so that other sacks of chemicals that we think are better sacks of chemicals have better chemical interactions. That works fine if there's no God. That's a very logical thing. If there's no God, there's nothing that sets out and says, this is evil, this is wrong, this isn't any good. Come on, we're sacks of chemicals. We're cosmic stardust that is congealed together. And through some lightning zap of electricity somewhere along the way, on some speck of a dirt clod out in outer space, has created this shin room where we sit and eat more chemicals. That's one view of reality. The other view of reality is that there's a real God who exists. This real God, thank you. I had chemicals on my fingers. <laughs> and I didn't have them inside my sack. There is a God who exists outside of space and time. And he's infinite, but he's also personal. There's personhood. There's personality. And he's also moral. And I'm saying he. The Bible says he often, but let's not be mistaken. The Bible will also refer to God at times as a mother. The Bible will also refer to God at times as a friend as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Don't start thinking God is simply a male figure because you're not being fair to the fullness of God. God's beyond sexuality. God's not a supersized human being of either gender. That's the image of God that's given in the Bible. And this is a God who creates male and female in his image. And so male and female uniquely bear the image of a moral God. So I was debating an atheist in, uh, on, on the radio in, in England a couple of years ago. And I said to him, I said, look, buddy, with all due respect, you would agree with me that human beings are unique and special. Even though as a guy who believes no God, you ought to just say we're all sacks of chemicals. He said, we are just sacks of chemicals. I said, oh yeah, but in your heart, you know that's not true. He said, of course it's true. I said, no, come on now. You know that's not true. He said, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, it is. It's a debate, see? It's back and forth. <laughs> I said, is your grandmother still alive? And he said, no. I said, man, did y'all eat her when she was dead? He said, what? I said, well, when she died, did y'all like have a feast and cook her up and Eat her? And he said, of course not. I said, why not? Did you let all that protein go to waste? He said, well, that was my grandma. I said, no, that's a sack of chemicals. Just like the steak you had for lunch. Unless you're willing to admit to me there's something special about a human. He said, well, couldn't I get disease if I eat grandma? And I said, maybe, but you could feed her to a pig and then eat the pig. I mean, chickens eat cockroaches and we eat their eggs. He said, I'm not doing that to, grand, to Nana. I said, no, you're not, because Nana is unique and special. And you know that by the way you're hardwired, even if you won't accept that because you don't want to admit there's a God. But I mean, that's, that's humans are made in God's image. And we exist to be in a relationship with God. So we crave relationships. Not only that, but we fail to measure up to God's moral perfection. We know right from wrong. And we fail to achieve it. 
God has restored the relationship. These are the fundamental premises of Christian and Judaic faith. Although Judaism is still exploring the how God restores the relationship part. But these are the fundamentals. Now, one of these worldviews is real. And here's the situation that we've got. I think in these options, if you look at the evidence, you're going to see a lot of people have double vision. They will say they believe one thing, but their life shows something very different, like my debate buddy and the death of his grandmother. Look, here's a strawberry, a half a strawberry. Now, this strawberry could tell you that it's a raspberry. And it could say, but it's true, I'm a berry. I can prove I'm a berry, I'm a berry. Yeah, but you're saying you're a raspberry, not a strawberry. You are a strawberry. You could think you're a raspberry all you want, but you're a strawberry and we know it. These people can say that there's no God, but their lives will never be lived consistently with that. They just can't do it. And the reason why is because there is a God. You can't live in the world of there is no God. Nobody can live consistently with that worldview. But everybody, the atheist and agnostic and believer alike, can live consistent with the Christian worldview and does. And that's the biggest element of proof there is. That's the evidence. You say, well, where is the evidence? Let me ask you this. Justice, fairness, it's important to all of us. We've got eight grandkids. You, those, those kids from an early age learn, it's not fair. Because it's hardwired in them. I was teaching a class on, on this at, at Wheaton. And, and one of the major problems the students had was if there's a God, why, aren't, why isn't life fair? And my comment back was, well, if there's not a God, who cares what's fair? Why does fair even matter to you? The fact that fair matters to you tells you you've been hardwired to believe it ought to be fair. And I'll go a step further and say God wants it to be fair, save for the part of your salvation. God wants it to be fair, and if you're a follower of His, you ought to try to make it fair, and it ought to bother you when it's not. Why do we uniquely value people? Why isn't there a feast when someone dies where we, you know, grind their bones to make our bread or whatever Jack and the Beanstalk's giant said? You know, do fish readily acknowledge the value in another fish? I mean, does the shark swimming in the sea say, Oh, there's a tasty fish, but he's a fish. I'm not going to eat a fish. I'm a vegetarian shark. Did you know over 70% of monkeys eat monkeys? Did you know pigs eat pigs? You say, yeah, but aren't there some cannibal tribes? Yeah, and there was Hitler too. But that's not the normative of society for people who believe or don't believe in God. That's deviant behavior. Why do people seek meaning and significance in life? I mean, honestly, do you think that that cheesecake down there is wishing it was something more monumental? We say, well, that's because it doesn't have the chemical reactions of a brain. Okay, I'd like to introduce you to my dog, Tizzy. My dog, Tizzy, is a sweet, sweet little dog, but she has no aspirations in this world. She doesn't want to go to college. She doesn't want to seem significant. She doesn't want to seem important. All she wants to do is eat, be near Becky, and urinate on the carpet. She doesn't dream the impossible dream, fight the unbeatable foe. 
She doesn't find people who serve in the military who will put their life on the line and be moved in emotion because of the valor that's there and the way we, we just so love that and appreciate that and respect that because there's something hardwired within us that recognizes the value of that. All of these aspects of evidence, including the other side of this coin, I deal with all of these carefully in the book. My goal is just to get you to read the book. Some of you will read it because you need help going to sleep at night. That, that's not really the key, though. The rest, try to read it when you're not so drowsy. Try to make it through some of this. Because those are important questions. Why is there suffering? Why does it bother you they're suffering? And so I deal with that in the book. Why can't I see God? That's actually a common objection of a lot of people. And I think a lot of people have never really thought through what it means to see something. Andy is sitting right here. Andy has this really good-looking plaid suit on. He's got a white shirt. He's got black shoes. The suit's kind of a grayish tint. may have some blue thread in it. Can't really tell. Now, do you know how I can see that? Because there's light. And light are waves, and those waves hit substance that he's wearing. And the substance he's wearing absorbs some of those light rays, bounces off others. The ones it bounces off, it bounces them off, and that's what we see as color because what's being bounced off then goes and enters that big black dot on my eyeball. And it goes and it's carried from the back of the eyeball along the optic nerve, crosses the optic chiasm. And if it's coming in my right eye, it deposits itself in my left hemisphere of my brain and tells me those light beams that are waves that are bouncing off his jacket tell me what he's wearing. Well, that works real good if his jacket's atoms that will absorb some of that light and bounce others. But do you know what happens if he doesn't have any atoms on? Well, then it's bouncing off of him. What if he's not made of atoms? It's not bouncing off of anything. The fact that you don't see God tells you that God's not made of atoms. That's all that means. He's not absorbing part of the light. And if there was a God, he would absorb all of the light. But if it absorbs all of the light, then technically there's no light to bounce back and it's black, which isn't a color, supposedly. True blackness in that sense. People just don't think these things through. I try to do it in the book. Why do so many prayers seem unanswered? Let's answer that. Let's look at it. How does God mesh with science? Last two chapters in the book. They don't compete against each other. God's truth is out there in the world. God's truth is in science. Science, the heavens declare the handiwork of God. Science is the tool that God has given us to combat this fallen world with all of its problems. Science is there, so I deal with that as well because the goal is to seek the truth. I'll close with this trial story. I was trying a case one time where there had been a pollution of benzene in drinking water. There'd been an underground blowout of an oil well and it had gone unreported and it had leaked 11 astrodomes worth of benzene and petrochemicals into the drinking water and it was covered up. And that was fine, I guess, for a while, but a community about a half mile downstream, underground downstream, drilled a water well and the the petrochemicals took a while to migrate that far, so they didn't know about it when they drilled the water well. They didn't find out about it until a 10-year review of their water indicated that for the last eight-plus years, they'd had 10,000 times the legal level of benzene. I represented a little boy who had leukemia caused by benzene. I represented five other families who had huge health problems caused by benzene. They'd been uh, drinking in it, bathing in it. 
drinking it, cooking with it, showering with it, using it to water their lawns, using it to play in the little fillable swim pool in the driveway. And the other side called an expert witness to the stand. They paid this fellow like $750 an hour. And he was a toxicologist. And he testified under oath that uh, there's nothing wrong with water that has 10,000 times the legal level of benzene. It's not really going to hurt you. Now, that was just bogus. But that's what he said. So uh, he finished his testimony on direct examination. We took a break uh, for the day and came back the next day with me to cross-examine him. And overnight, I'd gone to Rice University. It's not Lipscomb, but it's a good school. <laughs> and I'd gone to the chemistry department and got them to certify and seal a mason jar filled with water and 10,000 times the legal level of benzene. And I had it in my box under my counsel table. Next morning, the judge said, Mr. Lanier, you can start your cross-examination. And I said, thank you, Your Honor. And I looked at the witness, and I leaned forward conspiratorially. <laughs> and I looked both ways like, uh, you know, like nobody's here but us. And I said, hey, just between you and me. Of course, the court reporter's taking this down, the judge is listening, the jury's listening, and 50 people out in the galley are listening, but I'm, hey, just between you and me, that stuff you said about benzene, 10,000 times the legal level, not hurting you, you don't really believe that, do you? He said, well, of course I do. I said, no, come on now, this is you and me. They're paying you $750 an hour to say that, and I understand that, but like in the real world, you and I both know what you're saying is not true, don't we? He said, well, it's absolutely true. And I said, well, that's real interesting because, and I reached down and I got the jar out. I said, I got a jar here. It's been certified by the chemistry department at Rice University as having 10,000 times legal level of benzene in it. It's a jar of water. I said, I guess you'll drink this in front of the jury. And I walked up to him. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. And he looked at the jury. And this guy should never play poker. He does not have a poker face. <laughs> he looks at the jury and he looks at me and you could tell exactly what he was thinking. He was thinking, if I drink this, we're going to win this case. Of course, I could get leukemia. That would not be good. And they got to pay me whether we win this case or not. And if we lose, it isn't my money. Hmm. Maybe Lanier's bluffing. Maybe he won't really let me drink it. I think I'll play for the bluff. So he kind of leans forward a little bit and reaches his hand out like he's going to take it. Well, I mean, I can tell this guy's not any more drinking this water. He'd be an idiot to drink this water. So I just stuck it right there in front of his hand and right before it touched his fingers. He leaned back, pulled his hand away and said, well, I better not drink it. Uh, the chemist may have made a mistake. And the jury's sitting there thinking, you didn't believe that. You can say one thing and you might even convince yourself of one thing, but the truth is out there. And that's the way it is with this. Uh, I think a lot of people who don't believe in the existence of God, it's not as much an academic problem. I think it's an emotional problem. I don't think they've really sat down and looked at this subjectively. I don't think they've really weighed the evidence. Because I look at it, and to me, it's a no-brainer. I can't come to any other reasonable conclusion. And that doesn't mean that we don't have doubts. That doesn't mean there is no faith. But it means the greater weight of credible evidence is so substantial that I'm willing to live my life and stake my life on this truth that there is a God. I'm willing to trust in that ultimate truth. So that's uh, the, the basis behind the book. It's Seeking the Truth. And I would urge you to read the book. I hope that you will. Uh, Atheism on Trial. And I thank you so much for your time.
Okay, thank you, Mark. We're gonna put you on trial now for just a minute. Is that all right? We got about 15 minutes. So uh, the first question that I have, please be sending your questions or walking them up to me and we'll uh, wrap it round as many of these as we can get. Hold it up and we'll get some young people to come running through and grab them. Uh, is there a generational difference in the argument for or against the existence of God? For instance, a Gen Z versus a millennial or a boomer. Are, are there different answers? Yeah, different? yeah I, I think there is. I think that truth seems to change to some degree with the different generations. I think also there's a different interest level. And there was something interesting that happened in American Christianity in the end of the 1800s uh, that, that, that put science and um, faith at opposite ends of a teeter-totter. And, and they don't belong at opposite ends of the teeter-totter. Now, I, I want to be, be unequivocally clear with you. I'm not an evolutionist, but it's not because I don't believe that you can be an evolutionist and believe in God. It's not because I don't think that you can read Scripture in ways that keep the integrity of Scripture and also uh, uh, are fine with evolution. I don't see the Genesis account trying to fix Moses' science. I think it was trying to fix his theology. And so I talk about this in the book, but if, you, if, if, if you're talking to one of the more modern generation people who just seem to automatically believe that evolution is, is factual, um, I really don't think that needs to be the debating point on the existence of God. And so to deal with that differently in that younger generation than the older generation is something that I've found needs to be done. Great, great. Okay, so what's an atheist argument you have difficulty with explaining from a Christian view? The biggest atheistic argument that, that's difficult to argue and explain is why is there suffering? Human suffering we can get because there's evil among people. So human suffering is we live in a fallen world, uh, there are fallen people, you've got the Hitlers who do evil, wicked things to people, and there are evil people in this world, and they will do evil things to other people. That's a fact. That I can handle. The harder part to handle and explain is why then, if there's a good God, does a tornado come through and wipe out a bunch of good Christian people? Because that's not evil doing it. That's, the, that's, that's nature doing it. That's, that, to me, is the toughest argument to deal with. A um, couple of questions about sacks of chemicals here. Uh, one is, how do you know that God is in a sack of chemicals? Um, and uh, please discuss uh, the role of the soul as it relates to uh, the sack of elements. Oh, that's, those are both really good. So um, there's a book by Sharon Dirichs, D-I-R-Y-C-K-X, Y Z W Q N T. I'm not sure how she spells it, but she pronounced it Sharon Dirichs. Uh, she is a, a brain imager with her PhD or DPhil from Cambridge University. She teaches in Oxford right now. She'll be lecturing in our library in November. By the way, Dr. David Capes is not our librarian, Scott, nothing personal. He is actually the executive director of the library and is one of the most well-published Christian authors, had been dean of theology at Wheaton before we got him, and I urge you to visit with him if you get a chance. But he can tell you the details. Sharon Dirichs uh, is coming to speak on that. She wrote a book, Am I More Than Just a Brain? And it deals with the idea of what mind is and what a soul is. And those are deep issues that need to be dealt with. I do not deal with them in the book, but I love to engage with them and I'd love to talk to you about them. Um, the idea inherent in the book, though, is that we are more than a sack of chemicals, that there is something eternal about us that God has created. And, and, and what that winds up being is something that even Paul says, he doesn't know exactly what the immortal will be, but we will be clothed in immor immortality, not immorality, uh, immortality, 1 Corinthians 15. And so uh, within the framework of that, we don't know exactly what it will be. Now, is God a sack of chemicals? No, God has to be something more than that. If God's a sack of chemicals, I'm not sure I'd give him the title of God. I might just call him Superman or something like that or Superwoman, uh, Wonder Woman, because all of a sudden he's not infinite. But the God who is infinite knows my thoughts, knows my mind, knows things that are beyond what a, a, 
its own sack of chemicals could seem to know. But that's a philosophical argument. Yeah. Um, how, how do you uh, deal with uh, confirmation bias? Confirmation bias. Christianity. Yeah, confirmation bias is, is one of the most prevalent shortcuts that our brain takes in trying to make decisions. Confirmation bias means we tend to interpret arguments and evidence based upon opinions we've already formed. It's absolutely true. It's one of the most difficult issues to deal with as a trial lawyer. So I lecture on this. I've written on this. Um, uh, I teach on this. And I practice on this. The biggest way to deal with confirmation bias, if you think of your thinking in terms of, of two different thinking systems, and I'm not sure it's as clear as like Kahneman's thinking fast and slow, but there's a lot of peer-reviewed material on the way that the brain thinks in sort of two ways, system one and system two, we'll call it. System one is rapid, just responsive, intuitive. It's, it's an assessment that you're making many times without even thinking about it, okay? System two is more deliberative and careful. It's more reflective. System one is whether you like someone, just on first blush. System two is when you get to know them, whether you like them. System one is, is that uh, uh, great response that, that just comes automatically. System two is, can you really tell me pi to the seventh digit? 3.1, you know, and you sit there and try to work on it. It's deliberative and thought. Confirmation bias is best dealt with by forcing people to do system two thinking. Don't just give your gut reaction, but truly try to sit and sift and verbalize through the arguments because as you verbalize through them, it can help you deal with confirmation bias. And then the last thing I do is I tell everybody recognize confirmation bias is there. Uh, it, it is, and you've, you've got to try and recognize it to best deal with it. Okay, here's a, here's a question that more is agnostic, and it's, uh, it's, it's approaching it from that point of view. How would you respond to someone who believes that God set things in motion with a moral standard but then gave up on us? <laughs> the deistic argument. Um, well, uh, um, uh, first of all, I'm glad he didn't give up on us because... Uh, I need him, <laughs> and I can tell you he hadn't given up on me, and I can tell you he's been there for me. Uh, I, I deal with this in the book Christianity on Trial, and so if you want that, you got to get a different book than this one. Christianity on Trial, chapter first chapter is basically, is there a God of sorts? But chapter two is what kind of God is he, she, or it? You know, is God just some supercomputer, or, and and are we just uh, miniature programs that are living in a computer reality? Uh, sometime in the future. Uh, uh, you know, what kind of God is there? Did God just set up this world and walk away from it because it got frustrating? No, I don't think so. I don't think that that's the most reasonable. I think the most reasonable is a God who's willing to make all of this kind of stuff doesn't just walk away from it, but wants to engage. A God who made us engageable. You know, it, it's interesting. If you go back and read linguistic studies on how the language works in the brain, fascinating. Fascinating. And guy from MIT is really, really, he's still alive, I think, really, really made some changes on this in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And, and, and what, what he did is he understood that, that language is hardwired into our brain. So a God who knows and has made us and made us to be hardwired into language, isn't it reasonable to think he'd try and communicate with us through language? And the idea of scripture is not something that, that's bizarre. It would be bizarre to me if there's a God who made us and hardwired us for language and then didn't put it to use. So I deal with those arguments in Christianity on trial as well. Okay. I think I got one more question for you, but let me mention some that we didn't get to uh, just uh, because I apologize. But uh, do you feel like atheism has come more on the scene in the last 200 years and then yes. uh, this question about tornado and suffering, uh, there's a whole chapter in there, right, about yes. that? Yes. Okay. Um, this one and this one together, I think we'll use as the closing question. Yes. And then I've got all but one. Yes. Okay. Th this says, okay, so many really lousy things, KKK, other things have God 
and the existence of God prevalent in their DNA? Yes. Is, are, do those things end up being the great disprover of God? What's no. Been, what's okay. been done in the name of God? Okay, sneak preview. The next book, Other Junk on Trial, um, what I'm, World Religions on Trial. The, the first world religion that I look at is what I call people who are spiritual but not religious, which is the largest group of Americans right now. People who say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Okay, I deal with that in chapter one, chap, or first group. Second group I deal with are those who are religious, but not spiritual. And this includes people who use Christianity to put forward their puppet agendas, whether political, economical, or what economic, economic, or whatever it may be. And so I, 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 I'm, that's, that's in the next book coming out. But I also want to tell you something. As a, as a scripture-believing Christian, I thoroughly expect that. Because Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Peter said that Satan goes around like a, a, a hungry lion seeking those he might devour. Of course he's going to put on the guise of our faith to bring discredit to our faith. Some of the worst atrocities in the history of humanity have been done in the name of Christianity. Become a Christian or I'll kill you. Oh, thanks for the love of Jesus. Um, I, mean, I mean, you go back, there was a time where that was the line the KKK. I've got a buddy who goes to a church, his childhood church in Alabama, and he told me about the 1960s when all of the elders of the church, uh, the, the, the Baptists, they didn't have elders, they had deacons. All of the deacons, of, see, I'm not trashing the CSC here. All of the deacons of the church connected elbow to arm to arm to keep African-Americans from coming in the door. And I'm like, what? And then they go in and say, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, but you can't come in here if you're red or yellow, black, just only white. I'm like, what? That was at a church. People have done things in the name of Christianity that are absolutely reprehensible. But in the name of Christianity have been done some of the greatest, most wonderful, most selfless things in all of history. Because just as you'll find darkness trying to encroach on the kingdom, you'll find the purest light of God's Holy Spirit shining out and revealing what truth and love is. And Jesus didn't say you will know them by their political agenda. Jesus said you will know them by their love. And that a greater love has nobody than to give their life for someone. My two cents. Thank you. We want to thank Mark for uh, all that he's done for us. And I want to remind you that uh, we're going to let you make your way down to them. So... Mark, we really appreciate it. Becky, we're honored you all are here. Thank you for the gift of the book and for your time. And thank you for all the great questions that have been a part of this. Mark's gonna go on out and find a place to sit where if you'd like to get your book autographed by him, you can make your way out and catch him on the way out. Really cool thing in the, uh, the archaeology thing tomorrow. If y'all don't know about this, talk, where's, where's Tom Davis or Steve Ortiz? Talk to those guys. Uh, in honor of Dr. McQueen's inauguration, uh, uh, a, a really cool archaeological gift is being made to Lipscomb in, in her honor. And it's, it's good enough that we ought to like inaugurate her once a week. Yeah. <laughs> and then after 52 of these things, we'd have a world-class museum. Thank you. So that'll be tomorrow at two o'clock over in the library. You can catch uh, that 
part of the archaeology reception. But Mark's making his way out. I wanted to invite uh, Dr. David Holmes, Dean of our College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, who deserves a round of applause uh, in addition because he's been over all the symposiums this morning. So if you enjoyed the breakfast or anything that's happened between now, uh, between this morning and right now, you need to thank David Holmes for that. Uh, very quickly, uh, we want to make sure you go to the campus showcases, and we had a wonderful time. The little boy came from vacation Bible school, and he had a kite on a cloudy day. The wind was blowing, and as the wind was blowing, the kite seemed to be hidden behind the clouds. A man happened by who was a very well-educated atheist, and he began to taunt the boy. Why, why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in God? And the boy never answered until the time the atheist says to him, well, it seems as if you can barely see your kite. He says, well, that's just like God. I don't see him, but I can feel the pull. And for all that you've given us today, uh, Mark, we thank you for all of the arguments from, uh, we could say classical arguments from Aquinas about cause, about design. We thank you for realizing that in the end, we believe because we have felt the pull of God. I want to, in a moment, invite uh, Dr. David Capes of the Lanier uh, Theological uh, Library to come and lead us in a closing prayer. But just before he does, we want to remind you about our campus showcases. They begin at uh, 1.30 today. Of course, you will have an opportunity right outside to get uh, Dr. Lanier's book signed, but also you will have the opportunity to attend several showcases, brief opportunities of about 15 minutes or fewer, uh, and you will get to see some of our facilities as well as uh, some of our uh, fine faculty. So uh, we thank you so much, and now we'll turn it over to yeah. Dr. Capes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Would you stand with me, please, and have a prayer at the end of this uh, important and historic moment in the life of this university? Let's pray. Our Father, we give thanks, and we stand now in thanks for this good meal, for this important conversation, for this book, and for Mark Lanier and his family, and all that he has done for this university. We look forward to the next years with Dr. McQueen at the helm. We pray your blessing upon her and her administration. To think wisely, to choose wisely, to discern well, where the future is in Christian higher education. We ask you to, to lift up every valley, and we ask you to calm every sea, because we know that the future will bring some disconcert, uh, d discomfort and, and, and challenges on the days ahead. But we ask you to help these to be days of celebration, days of goodness, days of feasting, and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen.